coming out here to visit with you is sort of like a surgeon who finally gets out of uh, his surgical residency, goes and opens up a practice in some small town somewhere, and there's a wreck on the highway, and they bring someone in to be operated on, and they say, you got to save this guy's life. By the way, he's a world-renowned brain surgeon. <laughs> so every time I, I come out and visit with y'all and come to do other things with Jim and Jasmine and the group, I always think, I'm the dumbest one in the room. So uh, if you'll be patient with me for a little while, we'll, we'll dumb down a little bit together and, and, and do some visiting. <clears throat> I was touched by the comments about rejection. And so early on, I was told, do not list your name as Jack London, because, you know, <laughs> I'm related. And I'll tell this story, and then we'll kick it off. I was in a writing uh, tour in, in Italy. And I went to a Department of Defense school in Italy. And when you do these things, they'll uh, have a program at the school, and then they'll have a, a, a wine and cheese thing, and then you'll have a book signing in the evening, and so on. And this woman came up and said, God, I was so excited when I learned you were coming. I ran out and bought your book. <laughs> Would you sign it? <laughs> you know where this is. So she, she handed me Call of the Wild. <laughs> and I held it up, and I, I turned to the back picture, and there's Jack. <laughs> I open the copyright page, and it says 1904. <laughs> and she says, well, you sign it anyway. <laughs> so I signed it, yours in spirit, Jack <laughs> And then it turns out she is the... Uh, literature teacher for the DOD schools in Catania and has like 500 junior high and high school students that she's supposed to teach literature. And I'm a little nervous about her grasp of history, I suppose, her sense of history. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about the concept of sticking to your story. Every word counts. And if you take away from this one subtext, Consider this to be that one thing you take away. Not only does every word count, they'll either count for you or they'll count against you. And so let's just fire it off with the notion of sticking to your story. And I'll bet everyone in this room who has written a book, and probably poetry, has started off writing the story, and at some point found out they were writing what the story was about instead of writing the story. And when you pitch your story to someone, they say, what's your story? And instead of saying what the story is, you tell what the story is about. It's about this woman named Scarlett O'Hara. It's about this boy named Frodo, this hobbit. And so you need to, in my view, have a very clear distinction in your mind about what the story is and pair it away from what the story's about. And as you write, stick to what it is rather than illuminating what it's about. We're going to talk about that. Gone with the Wind worked not because it was about Scarlet chasing Rhett, not because it was a history of the Civil War. Those were what the story was about. But the story was Scarlet not even chasing, what was his name, Ashley? The story was about Scarlet chasing a way of life that was long gone and never coming back. Frodo, I think, uh, Lord of the Rings, was not a story about him and the guys going through adventures and throwing the ring into the fire and finding Mordor. It was a story about Frodo finding Frodo. And everything in those books supplemented those story challenges. The backstories in them did not become complete in and of themselves, nor were they left dangling. <clears throat> they all confronted the challenge. And if you'll go to Gone with the Wind, 
page one starts off with planning to go to a ball at a plantation. That's a way of life. And Scarlet chasing that. Page one, roughly, of the Lord of the Rings starts off with the appearance uh, of Gandalf saying, I've got a mission for you. And Frodo and his guys saying, I don't want a mission. And then the ring coming out. <clears throat> the second part of sticking to your story is knowing who your audience is and writing the story for your audience. And you need some internal honesty in that process. If you want to be the next Hemingway or the next Jane Gardner or whomever, J.K. Rowling, then you need to be able to write as well as they did, and you can do it. But if your audience really is 500 people, then you ought to be really proud that you can write a story for 500 people. Not that you're a failure for failing to attract a million people. Your craft is in your story. Your craft is not in the volume of your audience. I want to tell you a story. Um, will you give me, move forward one slide, maybe, let's see. That's what this is about. One more slide. It's very hard to see in here. When Rob and Jim told me last night I had a slide projector, I said, can I throw up a couple of images? And they said, yes. In Paris, there is a museum of Picasso. Probably some of you have been to it. Many of you have heard of it. I would bet the number of us who truly understand Picasso's art is a little smaller. <laughs> but the story is uh, well known about it. a couple of uh, a, a tourists who takes his 14-year-old son to the Picasso Museum, and they look at these two images. And the dad says, who wants to say? My 14-year-old son can do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I have the next image? And the curator says, before your 14-year-old son needs to be able to paint those, your 14-year-old son needs to be able to paint this. And this is the image that Picasso painted of a young woman on a deathbed when he was 14 years old. I'm sorry I can't show it to you any more clearly than that. But this image tells a story. It has characters, a conflict, and the third ingredient we'll talk about in a moment. It is a woman on her deathbed. The title of it is uh, something like Science and uh, the Afterworld. If you look on the left, there is a doctor taking the woman's pulse. Is she alive or is she dead? On the right, there is a nun holding the woman's child. So you have the conflict of science and religion. You have the conflict of life and death. You have the conflict of mom fearing for her own life as well as for her child's life. And they're told with absolute clarity that anyone seeing that picture can understand. Now, what's the moral of my story? The moral of my story is that before you start painting like Picasso's more cubist, neo-nihilistic work, you need to learn how to, how to paint the simple ones, the clear ones, to paint between the lines. Because, are you ready? Every word counts. Let's start at the beginning. I'm going to read you something. Um, from the beginning of the book. Renowned curator Jacques Saunier staggered through the vaulted archway of the museum's grand gallery. Okay, what's the, what does that tell the reader? <laughs> well, now I'm not asking you what the book is about, I'm asking you what this tells the reader. Renowned curator Staggers. Sounds to me like the renowned curator, it's, it's an obituary. He lunged for the nearest painting he could see at Caravaggio. Grabbing the gilded frame, the 76-year-old man heaved the masterpiece toward himself until it tore from the wall and Saunier collapsed backward in a heap beneath the canvas. Okay. 
here's what I'm getting out of that. First, it's about renowned curator Jacques Saunier. It sounds like an obituary. And if this fellow is in a museum that has a Caravaggio, do you really need to say he's renowned? Of course he's renowned. Okay. Gilded frame, does it matter? Oh, yeah. It's a Caravaggio. You're not there to look at the frame. It can be a wood frame. It can be a brass frame. It can be no frame. It's a Caravaggio. 76 years old. Obituary. You're going to love this. That's how obituaries read. 76-year-old lawyer, Jack London. You know, passed away. He, grabbing the gilded frame, the 76-year-old man heaved the masterpiece. It's a Caravaggio. Do you need to say it's a masterpiece? Of course it's a masterpiece. And heaved it toward himself. Would anybody in this room show me how you can heave something toward yourself? And I love this one. He collapsed backward in a heap. Doesn't it take more than one to make a heap? So, by the end of the first paragraph, I'm annoyed. <laughs> now, I'm being a little bit of a particularist, but I'm trying to make a point. Because by the end of this first paragraph, Brown has planted some errant seeds. I don't know about the end of the first paragraph if this is about a museum, about a guy who had a heart attack and pulled one off the wall, if it's an obituary, if Saunier is going to become the main character. I just don't know. I've been annoyed enough by the bad writing that I can't even think about where this thing is going. So I, I uh, wanted to ask myself, how could this have been written? Listen to me, and, and I'm going to read this. Saunier staggered through the vaulted archway of the museum's gallery. He lunged for the nearest painting he could see, the Caravaggio. Grabbing its frame, the old man tore it from the wall and collapsed on the floor beneath the canvas. It's clear. It's crisp. It does not tart itself up with a bunch of adjectives. And it doesn't tell you whether or not something is... 76 years old, or renowned, or gilded. It gets you rolling. Now, why am I talking to you about uh, a book that, frankly, was uh, very popular and enormously well uh, profitable? It's because nearly anyone who wrote that book seriously, uh, read that book seriously, did it not because of Caravaggio, not because of uh, Saunier, not even because of the mystery that by, you know, almost no time everybody knew. It's because it became a tourist book. You know, all of us have some concept of both masterpieces and of Paris and of the Louvre and of Saint Sulpice, is that where the church was? And most of us, be honest with yourselves, read the book and continued despite it, not because of it. <laughs> and I read it, and it only took two and a half years, and I got right through that thing. <laughs> if he had had people read the book in two weeks, they would have bought the next one right off the bat. But he didn't write a book that you wanted to read in two weeks. If you weren't reading a French chase scene with unbelievable uh, coincidences. Oh my God, I know this guy out on the outskirts of town. Oh, I know, he has an airplane. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and they all happen to be in the same secret group. So, back to Picasso. Would you rather write between the lines where people will read it and build your craft, or would you rather write books that are not very well written that are going to hit some of those rejection slips. That's the task. Okay? We're taking from here. <coughs> We've already talked about the concept of what is your story. But let's talk about the three things that readers look for when they open a book. Number one, 
what is this, who is this book about? Who in this room reads the first page or the first page, a couple of pages? And what you're trying to find out when you read them is, who is this book about? Everybody? Nobody? Okay. And one, number two, what is this book about? You're probably reading it because you saw something on the jacket cover or in the book reviews or because a friend told you. This is a book about the museums in Paris or this is a book about a secret society. Okay. Who wants to take a stab at what is the third thing that readers look for when they begin to read a book? Why is it interesting? Where do I come in? What role am I going to play in this? The reason is because if we don't see ourselves as a character or in the room watching the characters, we lose touch with the book pretty quickly. Someone asked me what my favorite movie was, and I said Casablanca, and they said, what role did you play? I thought, oh, wow. That's, that's pretty thoughtful insight. And I said, um, you know the tutorial I play. So, <laughs> and so what we're talking about is in order to make your reader find where your reader enters the book, you have to pay attention to Elmore Leonard's 10th rule. You have to leave out the parts that people tend to skip. And the parts that people tend to skip are the parts where the reader doesn't see himself or herself as one of the characters or see himself or herself present in the scene watching. If you write things that are about people they don't care about, don't want to become a part of, or if you write about things that are so alien to the experience of an ordinary person that you cannot stay with it. You can't imagine this happening to you or someone you know or someone you care about. You tend to put the book away. So do your readers. So the parts that people tend to skip are the parts that are not intimate to their experience or the parts that they can't see themselves playing for themselves, even in historical fiction. If you're writing about, uh, what were all of those Philippa Gregory books about the uh, Woodville family, great family, the Woodvilles are great books. If you don't see yourself as a woman in one of those rooms, either one of the Woodville women, or perhaps one of the Yorkist women, or one of the women who helped them, or if you don't see yourselves as one of the Yorkist or uh, Lancastrian fighters, you don't care about that book. If you want to read about the history of the Wars of the Roses, you'll just go read a history book. But if you want to read a novel about it, it better have you in it. Okay? If you're going to write a thriller, and I know a lot of our members in this room are not only thriller writers, but are really good thriller writers. I'm going to give you a piece of advice. No one reading your thriller book cares about the different models of handguns, rifles, and assault weapons. No one cares. I do not see myself as having some Russian-made nine magazine automatic something. And even worse, they don't care what the villain has. The villain has a weapon. It can be a gun, or it can be a rocket, or it can be something. But you don't need to give the technical specifications. If you're writing a military book, you get to use two numbers and that's it. <laughs> that's all. You only get to say first army or second platoon. The more you start coming up with the 305th of the 416th, <laughs> own detail in the third sector of the fourth quadrant. Uh, yeah. And you know why? Because it's the same problem as the Da Vinci Code. You're sending a signal that this is important, but it's not. In the early pages of the book, 
no one knows what's important. And if you put words in the early pages, we readers think this is important. I think it must really be important that, he, that it was a Caravaggio. I think it must be important that he pulled it off the wall. I think it must be important that he was renowned. So that's the place at which you lose your readers when you're putting in things that your readers really neither care about or get confused about, and 10 pages later on, they find out this really didn't matter at all. Okay? So, how big a trap is this? Who knows of Kazuo Ishiguri, who just won the Nobel Prize for Literature? Everybody knows Kazuo Ishiguri. Please tell me all. He, he's the author of The Remains of the Day. He also is the author of a book called An Artist of the Floating World. He's an artist of a book called Never Let Me Go. You may know those books, you may not, but they're phenomenal books. And he's also the author of a clunker called The Unconsoled. I'm going to read you a little bit of the review of The Unconsoled. I'm not sure precisely how to read this book. Uh, but, at any rate, what I'd like to talk about is not what is being enacted in these pages, but the strange dynamics of the book's plot. It has an extremely, extremely digressive plot, so digressive that it would not be wrong to describe it as nothing more than the continued repetition of delayed gratification because the protagonist never finishes a single thing he sets out to do. And this happens again and again and again, for over 500 pages. It's like when a cartoon character suddenly reaches off screen to grab a rocket to throw it, to shoot at his friend. Why'd he do that? Why not a ray gun? Why not an anvil to drop on his head? Why interrupt the protagonist to do it at all? Why not interrupt him for that? Or, 50 pages back, the book feels arbitrary, as though I could have skipped 100 pages right in the middle of it and more or less had a worthwhile experience as if I had actually read those hundred pages. That's pretty harsh, and that's what happened to a Nobel Prize winner. And every Nobel Prize winner for literature that I know of has one of those clunkers in the closet. Uh, has anyone read Ernest Hemingway's Across the River and Into the Trees? And has anyone finished it? It's an awful book. <laughs> and the reason why is because the authors become so infatuated with the minutiae experiences of their characters that they don't stick to the story. Okay? Now, here are some hints on how to leave out the parts that people tend to skip. I've already told you, do not hide your story from the reader. That's what the Da Vinci Code did. Number two, don't over-describe your characters. Has anyone read a book called Catch-22? <laughs> Let me see if I can find what I brought to read about Catch-22. Somewhere, maybe, maybe not. It's dead, I lost it. <laughs> There is a paragraph in Case 22 in which a character named Major, 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 Major is introduced. Major, 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 Major was so ordinary and so mediocre that the only thing anyone knew about Major, 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 Major was that he looked a lot like Henry Fonda. And since he was given the unfortunate name Major, Major, he was accidentally promoted to people who were far less mediocre than he was, but due to his mediocrity, he was afraid to give any of them orders. Now, before the book was released, there was an entire chapter on Major Major. It went into his background as a small university professor in New England who hated Henry James. And it talked at length about what Major Major didn't like about Henry James. 
and then about what Henry James's failures were as a both a historian and a novelist, and how Major Major's enterprising dissertation on those topics was disrupted by an inconvenient war in which he was drafted and on his third day became an officer. Would any of that have made your reading experience of Catch-22 any better? Because it wasn't what the story was about. All it took for Yossarian's story of a dystopic military in a chaotic war was to give him some dystopic characters. You don't have to give dystopic characters life's histories or work histories. There's a sub-rule to this called don't over-describe secondary characters. The more you describe them, the more I read your book and think it's a major character. And then when they go off and don't amount to much, I've, I've been misled and I think, I must have gone to sleep while I was reading this part. I've got to go back and find out what happened to this character. And I get kind of grumpy when I find out that I didn't find out anything because it didn't matter. So, don't over-describe your characters, and for God's sake, don't give long-life histories, infidelities, jobs, military careers, likes, dislikes, to your secondary <coughs> characters. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you one that I love beyond all. Do not over-describe details. Do not over-describe details. Subnote, do your research. You must know your details. If you don't know your details, especially in historic fiction or in site-specific fiction, then you will actually write something big and bold that will come out wrong, and someone who does know the details will say, this guy got it wrong. But just because you know the details doesn't mean you have to write them. I once wrote a, in fact it's here, it's a book on uh, uh, a young army doctor who's thrown up on Omaha Beach on, on D-Day. And I wanted to know how the guys got off the landing boats and onto the beach. Draft three. <coughs> the bow doors of the landing ship, comma, hinged on their 574 pound load of stress, bearing roller bearings, Six to each door, hinged in the middle with. <laughs> what the book was about. And so I'm going to take you to Bernard Cornwall. Who, who in this room is a fan of Bernard Cornwall? Okay. He writes these several different kinds of books. He writes Sharps Rifles, all about the guys in India who are all miraculously saved by one hard bitten sergeant. He writes about uh, a half Viking, half English halfling. Udri. That's right, who always gets the girl and uh, stands up for wrong. And um, then he wrote a book about Azincourt. Azincourt was, uh, you who join me today in battle are my brothers. We band, we mighty few, once more into the breach. Okay, that's where the English army uh, stumbled around and caught the overweight, over-armored French on horseback and shot them with arrows. So early in the book, as in Cor, uh, our hero is inside some walled town in France, and he goes over to Wilkinson's stable, where Wilkinson's role in this book is to say, the French king is going to come take this town back. We have to get ready. Okay? It was hot in Wilkinson's stable. The old man had a fire burning in a round brick oven, on top of which a cauldron of water steamed. He took an arrow, then carefully placed a thick pad of folded cloth over the ash shafts and weighted the cloth's center with a stone. I steam them, boy, Wilkinson explained. Then I weights them, and with any luck I straightens them, and then the fledgling falls off because of the seam. Half aren't fledged anyway. <laughs> Wilkinson used glue to replace the goose feathers that fledged the arrows. Okay. And there's no silk, he grumbled, so I'm having to use sinew. The sinew bound the slit feathers to the arrow's tail, reinforcing the glue. But sinew's no good. 
it dries out, it shrinks, and it goes brittle. I've told Sir Roger, we need silk thread. But he don't understand. He thinks an arrow is just an arrow, but it isn't. Wilkinson tied a knot in the sinew, then turned the arrow, which would lie on the string when the arrow was shot. <laughs> the knot was reinforced by a sliver of horn that prevented the bow's cord from splitting the ash shaft. The horn resisted Wilkinson's attempt to dislodge it, and he grunted before taking another arrow from its leather discs. A pair of the discs, which had indented edges, held two dozen arrows apiece, pulling them apart so that the fragile goose feather fledglings would not get crushed while the arrows were transported. Feathers and horn, ash and silk, still in varnish. This one we can make into a proper killer. Make yourself useful, lad. Get the bodkin off. The arrow's head was a narrow piece of steel. This goes on for two and a half pages. And it's on page 38 and 39 of the book. So, knowing that the title of the book was Azincourt, even spelled in the French spelling, I thought, this is going to be a book about how the arrows were made in the war. <laughs> no, this was a book about one bowman who gets the girl, uh, defeats the opposing uh, French forces chief knight, and does anyone remember that it happened on St. Crispin's Day? St. Crispin's Day. Because he has uh, been in this little village attacked, he actually has personal uh, extraterrestrial communications with St. Crispin himself, who tells him how to avoid being killed at different times during the course of this event. That was a hard book to finish. And I finished it in record time. Uh, I, uh, I read the entire three-volume set of the Durrells in Corfu. Uh, that's about 1,100 pages. I read the four-volume Elena Ferranti series, uh, all set in Naples, 2,100 pages. All of those before I finished reading. <laughs> and then I would go to sleep one night and say, you know, I really need to go to sleep. I'm going to pick up Bernard Cornwall and read some uh, arrow uh, It's not up there. It, it, the opening slide had not only my name, which I'm told I'm going to have to change, <laughs> but it has my email address. Uh, that's me. And it has jwlbooks.com, which is my literary website, on which I publish book reviews. My own reviews. And I review books on, it's called On the Nightstand. I review books and rate them based on the watts they give off. A 100 watt book keeps me awake all night. I'll read and read and read. A 20 watt book is about a two-page boom, I'm a sleep book. And then there are all these gradations in between. And my 100 watts might not be your 100 watts. My 20 watts might not be your 20 watts. I would be hard-pressed to find anyone who stayed awake all night reading about fledged arrows and bodkins and leather, and leather discs. And it helped me immensely. I was the best rested in that time of my life. So, what we just talked about was number three, don't over-describe details. Couldn't he have said everything by saying, whatever our hero's name is, went to Wilkinson's shop, and while they worked on the arrows that would be necessary, Wilkinson told him what to expect in the coming assault when the French forces arrived. Doesn't that do it? And then number four, and this is the one that people tend to really do well or really struggle. Dark, uh, it's dialogue. When you write dialogue, <coughs> write dialogue the way people actually talk. Have people in their dialogue do things that people actually do. 
and we're going to spend a little bit of energy. I hope a lot of y'all are going to stick around for the workshop. These are fun. But we're going to spend some time at this afternoon learning how to talk about how like, people actually talk and doing things that people actually do in order to write novels that are set in a different time and in a different place. It could be historical fiction, it could be thrillers, it could be anything, but it's not set on Eubank Avenue in Albuquerque in 2019. <coughs> but when you're writing fiction, you lose readers fast. When you write dialogue that goes on for sentence after sentence after sentence, except for speeches, we don't speak in five, six, seven sentence strings. And when we reply, our replies are usually one of two kinds. Usually we either say, that's a good point, or I agree with your point of view, or we disagree and argue and reply in one or two sentence explanation replies. And when you're having a conversation between your characters, whether they're primary, secondary, incidental, they need to be engaged in doing things that people actually do because maybe that's the character that your reader sees himself or herself in the book. If they're doing things that no one ordinarily can see themselves doing, people don't believe you. I'm going to give you an excerpt uh, from a thriller. The gist of this story is a book um, where a hero in Washington, D.C. parses out that there is a plot not only on the president and the vice president and most of the other people in uh, the cabinet to kill them all and take over, but there is a, another plot going on in which women who have all been uh, members of the military were sexually abused by a superior uh, NCO or a superior officer who then lied about it and never got punished. And so these women have all decided that they'll follow a dark angel who will have them uh, strap explosives to their bodies and go into officers' clubs and kill everyone. Um, that's kind of a far fetch. <clears throat> and here we have one uh, who is mad. There was a guy named uh, Tooney who apparently abused some woman and the dark angel uh, carved Tumi up and left him dead on the beach and that made all of the women willing to become acolytes of the dark angel, including this acolyte, Sergeant Margot Collins. Paced back and forth in her motel room, she had arrived in Fairfax, sad and lonely, after leaving her friends in New Jersey. Frustrated at being kept separated in this place, not able to talk with anyone in case she might slip, tipping them off as to what she was about to do. She watched the stars out of her window, wondering when she would leave. The time for her mission had come. She felt ready, tired of the depression that engulfed her, and sick of everyone looking at her with sorrow about the rape. Men, her best friend, didn't want to touch her. As far as he was concerned, she had been branded soiled goods, all because of Toomey and his buddies. Colonel fucking Toomey. The Dark Angel had paid him back. Now it was up to her, Margot, to get the others. She would make the Dark Angel proud. There really is some dialogue in him. <laughs> Collins turned away from the window and got down on her knees to pray for strength. Strength to forget the weakness of the body. And after her prayer, she rose. After Toomey's death, she had dedicated her life to the Dark Angel. Her sisters were waiting, looking for her to lead. She would be the first. They were all ready to sacrifice everything for the Dark Angel, the only person who really cared for them. Cared what had happened to each of them. This provided her with a sense of calm. A knock sounded on the hallway door. A slender woman with bushy dark hair and a narrow face stood waiting. Collins opened the door. The woman looked up and down the hallway. Come with me, it's time. I'm ready. This way, hurry. 
Right here, I'll be back in a moment. The woman pushed in a number on her cell phone and handed it over. It's her. Collins picked up the phone and with shaking hands put it to her ear. Are you ready, Margo? The dark angel asked. Ready to strike back for all those who can't? Ready to right the wrong done to you by those two men the way they lied about you? Yes, I'm ready. I won't fail you or my sisters. This briefcase is the first step on our path to regain our rightful place. With that, people will know. They will no longer forget what has happened. Those bastards will not be able to do their evil deeds any longer and get away with it. Our prayers go with you, Margot. You must drive through the night. I will not fail. Now, <coughs> those didn't sound like humans. Uh, I could make myself wrap around the idea that women had in some way formed a group bent on revenge. I had a lot of trouble believing that this was the way they were going to get it <laughs> by finding uh, impressionable young victims to go blow themselves up in officers' clubs. But if they were going to do it, I thought it would be a good idea not to have them sound like zombies. <laughs> Margo, I know this is going to be tough. Are you going to be able to do this? Yeah, I'm going to be able to do this. <laughs> you sure? You can back out. Nope. You know this is a big step forward for womankind, don't you? I hope so. Well, you know, this it's like the difference between uh, scrambled eggs for breakfast and, and bacon. Do you all know what the difference is? <laughs> for the chicken, it's a day's work. For the, for the pig, it's, you know, you're all in. <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking, how does this woman persuade Margot to blow people up and still say, this one's for the sisters? Uh, so, when you write dialogue, find someone and go talk to them and say, well, let's role play for a minute, especially if it's critical stuff. Because when you role play this stuff, they're not going to sound like, I'm striking one for the sisterhood. I am ready. I pray that I will be successful. So, when you're leaving stuff out, I'm a, I'm a pretty big advocate not only of not hiding your story, not over-describing your characters, not over-describing details, but for God's sake, talk like people talk. Uh, let's wrap up. I've probably spoken too long. But here are the things I wanted to highlight. Before you set out to paint an avant-garde painting and pushing your envelope, learn how to paint brilliantly conventionally. Do not believe you've already written your best work. Guard against coasting. If you believe you've already written your best work and you can coast from here on out, you're going to be like Kazuo Ishiguri and write a piece of crap that no one can read. And you will say, they will read it because I wrote it. Don't do that. And remember, the thing the reader wants to know most, where do I figure in this story? Leave out everything that does not tell the reader here. That's it. Thank you. I love being here. Um, Jim suggested that we have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes to talk. Uh, if anybody wants to ask questions, uh, I can further embarrass myself with bad answers from the podium. Uh, I would be thrilled if you wanted to take a look at my website, if you got my email. I do answer my email. Uh, first draft, un unlike what Jim says, is my newsletter. It's my more or less every month or two newsletter. And uh, I write about what I'm doing. This will be a subject of my next newsletter. Uh, you may be in it, if I get your name or your photograph. Uh, during 2017 and 2018, each episode, I write three or four paragraphs about what was happening in the United States 100 years ago, because we're in the centennial of World War I. And so I spend a little bit of time on the home front, and I spend a little bit of time on what's happening in the military at that time. 
Um, and then I have a true and false quiz about things that you might want to know. And I have a chapter of a serialized book that I'm publishing only for readers of first draft. And it comes out one chapter at a time. And, you know, it's just kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, that's where you get book reviews. And, uh, we just have a good time. We talk about research, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so, I'm, I've now done the surgery. I hope the famous brain surgeon on whom I did my first operation has survived. Uh, alternatively, I would be so dead that they haul him off and bury him before they found out how bad a job I did. <laughs> Questions?